今天我们要关注的话题是经期健康。可能大家会觉得奇怪，我一个大老爷们儿为什么要关注这个话题呢？其实大姨妈不仅仅是一个女性私人话题，在这背后关乎着广大女性朋友的健康和尊严。而且月经贫困也已经成为一个世界性难题。消除月经贫困，中外该如何合作呢？我们今天邀请到两位朋友，首先欢迎联合国人口基金驻华代表康家庭博士。Dr. Justin Cozen, let's welcome her. She is the representative of UNFPA China. 还有一位是快手博主、科学少女壳匠王红坦，她也是一位很有名的科普博主。Hello, 主持人好，大家好，我是科学少女壳匠。嗯，欢迎二位。啊、uh, ，那么我们接下来的第一个问题呢，想要问康家庭博士。So the first question is actually for Dr. Cozen. Uh, 28th of May is the World、uh, Menstruation Hygiene Day, and、uh, but a lot of people may be very curious that、uh, why there is such a day like this, and why it is on 28th of May. No, thank you. And and obviously, why do we need a day for something that is a completely natural biological process that happens every month for women and adolescent girls around the world? And and the reason for that is that. Even if we look in high-income countries as well as low-income countries, millions of women and girls every day are being discriminated against or treated badly because they're menstruating, and this could be because of cultural taboos or stigma. It could be that they lack money to buy sanitary products. Maybe they can't go to school because they're teased. So there's a whole range of reasons why women and girls are unable to actually manage their menstrual health. With dignity, which we consider a human right. So this is why Menstrual Hygiene Day is so important. It's a time when we come together globally as governments, as United Nations, as communities, as individuals, to really shine a light and highlight the challenges that women and girls around the world are facing. Having conversations such as these, and also really to come together and think about what action can we take, whether as communities or individuals, to really help resolve. Some of these challenges that women and girls are facing in terms of managing their menstrual health effectively.、Mm. So talking about this, I heard that in some countries, actually, there are some girls and women were actually humiliated or even、uh, discriminated because of the just、uh, on the period of menstruation. So they cannot go to certain places or even take part in some uh, uh, daily activities. So is this a very common thing around the world right now? Yeah, so I think what we have to recognise is that discrimination and mistreatment of women and girls when they're menstruating is not just something that happens in less developed,、uh, less developed countries. So it's true that in a number of cultures, what we see is that because women are sometimes considered unclean or dirty when they menstruate, which is obviously a myth. Then they are pushed away from their community. So maybe they're not allowed to come into the house, or they're not allowed to come into community spaces or into religious areas, and they're very often forced to stay in、um, environments on their own, which may be unsanitary or unsafe. But I think we also have to recognise that there are other forms of discrimination that are happening in many countries. So, for example, when a girl goes to school when she's menstruating, she's sometimes teased or even sexually harassed by boys. We may have teachers who don't feel able or they're too embarrassed to speak up and stop these practices happening. Um, we also see in some cultures that when a girl starts menstruating, menstruating, so from the first time she menstruates, then sometimes it's believed that she's ready for marriage, or maybe she's ready to start sexual relationships, even though she's still a child. And so we see that these girls may be forced into an early marriage, which is extremely damaging for them, or may be forced into sexual relationships even when they're not able to give consent. And so I think there's a whole、uh, range of ways. In which women and girls are facing this form of discrimination, I think we also have to remember that today across the world there are many humanitarian crises, so both conflicts and natural disasters such as drought, and so there's millions of women and girls who've been displaced from their communities, and so we very often think about these people needing shelter, needing clean water, needing adequate food, but we forget. That even in a humanitarian crisis, 
women and girls continue to menstruate every month and they need support. So one of the things that we do as UNFPA in humanitarian crises is really um, giving out what we call dignity kits, which include sanitary products, they include soap, and we also ensure that there are safe and clean bathroom facilities for women and girls as well, so they can uh, manage their menstruation um, even through these difficult times. And then I think we also shouldn't forget the role of health workers. So, you know, sometimes women and girls are coming forward and they are struggling with their menstruation, maybe because of severe pain, maybe because of period irregularities. And there are many health workers who really don't know um, what information to give or advice in that situation, or maybe they just don't think it's an important public health issue. So all of these different things are happening, you know, which makes it very challenging for many women and girls across the world to manage their menstrual health successfully. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. 好的，那么接下来这个问题，我们也也想问一下何酱啊，就是你觉得月经羞耻的这个文化是存在的吗？嗯，其实现在在我们的日常生活中，包括刚刚主持人哈，我们在提到月经，在提到呃或者是相关的卫生用品的时候，我们都会有意识无意识的用其他的词去代替。就比如说，我们都很难在公共场合听到有人去说把月经就是呃直接说出来，而是会用像是什么姨妈间啊、姨妈，还有啊什么倒霉事啊、那个来了呀，用这些词来去替代呃月经以及跟月经有关的这样的事物。所以其实这个也是一个很明显的月经羞耻的一个体现，嗯，而且月经羞耻其实它是源自于历史上大家对于月经本身这个生理现象的不了解，嗯、哪怕是随着时代发展，到了现代医学已经呃完全揭开了这个月经的神秘面纱之后，但是呢，月经羞耻依然还是刻在了很多很多女性啊、呃、很多人的这样的认知里面，嗯，再从中西方的历史上来看吧。就是呃，月经因为和性相关，和就是它本身是一种很私密的事物，常常会遭到污名化。但是在罗马时代，呃，著名的百科全书作者普林尼啊、呃，他说，呃，如果是经期的妇女碰到了铁，铁会生锈；而如果碰到了麦子，麦子会枯萎。所以月经其实还是会遭到这样各种各样的污名化，然后这样的羞耻感也是一代一代的，就是刻在了这种女性的观念里，也刻在了。呃，全人类的这样的认知里，嗯，但是呢，呃，因为现代科学揭秘了之后、呃，我们也知道这是一个非常正常的生理现象。地球上有一半的人类啊、呃，都要经历这样的这样的一个生理现象。月经就是没有什么好羞耻的，呃，但是想要打破这个呃几千年的认知的错误，打破这样的枷锁，还是需要一代一代人的努力，它不是一个一蹴而就的事情。所以，嗯、呃，我在想，如果想要消除。这样的月经歧视、月经羞耻这样的问题，其实教育是一个呃起点，是一个非常重要的环节。因为在呃小朋友不断成长的过程当中，在树立三观、树立自己认知体系的这个时候，这个时候非常关键。所以家庭教育和学校的教育，呃，关于女性知识的教育就非常显得非常的重要。呃，想必呃像很多九零后、八零后，呃，在从小接受到的这个女性知识教育，关于经期。关于月经，关于各种卫生用品的认知，它其实是很不够的。学校教育教的很，嗯、呃，教育的不是很充足，嗯，所以大家会有一些、嗯、呃错误的认知、呃。这个是从教育的角度上，呃，我呢作为这个科普视频的创作者，呃，以及其他的科普垂类的这样的视频创作者也好，文字创作创作者也好，在这个消除这样的呃月经羞耻文化这样的努力上呢，我们也是可以持续的去输出这样的内容。希望可以，嗯，让大家有一个相对正确的认知吧，以及也很欢迎大家去看一些比较好的这样的影视作品啊，这些可以反映，呃，就是月经这个话题，在很多国家它是会让很多女性非常困扰，呃，反映这种社会现实的这样的影视作品也很欢迎大家去看，嗯。好的，非常感谢柯江的分享。So the next question is for、uh, Dr. Carson. There is a very recognizable thing around the world right now is called、uh, period poverty. So could you please firstly explain what exactly is period poverty? So very simply, period poverty is when a woman or an adolescent girl doesn't have sufficient money. To buy the menstrual products or the sanitary products that she needs every month to allow her to manage her her menstruation,、uh, 
Um, it also can be when the cost of managing her period, and that's not just sanitary products, that could also be the cost of um, pain medication, or maybe she needs to buy new underwear, actually stretches her budget so far that it pushes her further into poverty. And I think what's important to say is that we see period poverty, not just in the poorest countries. It's about the poorest women and girls in every country that tend to be affected. So for example, if you look at the European Union or you look at my country, the United Kingdom, it's estimated that one in every 10 girls cannot afford the sanitary products that they need every month. And we also have to recognize that with COVID-19, we've seen a lot of extra economic pressure on households across the world. And therefore we've seen increasing numbers of women and girls who are struggling to find sufficient money every month to buy those sanitary products um, that we need. Now, this isn't just about not being able to access the product, which obviously makes menstruation very difficult, but it's also the fact that because women and girls need that product and they don't have the money, they can actually be forced into very risky behaviors. So we've seen research where girls actually feel forced to go out and steal products from shops because they simply can't afford them. We've seen research in certain countries where, where girls feel forced into transactional sex as the only way that they can get the money they need in order to be able to buy these products. I think also what we see is that sometimes because girls can't afford the products, then they don't go to school. Because how can you go to school when you're menstruating and you don't have a pad or you don't have a tampon? It, it's impossible for girls and they feel extremely embarrassed and ashamed um, by this. But interestingly, we have seen governments globally recognizing more and more that they need to take action to address period poverty. So just two years ago in Scotland, Scotland became the first government around the world to make sanitary products free in schools and in colleges and also in low income communities. And actually, they've just launched a new app where if you are someone who can't afford sanitary products, you can go onto the app and find out where free products are available in your community, which is a, a phenomenal um, commitment by a government. We've also seen around the world more and more governments reducing value added tax, so VAT, taking VAT off sanitary products to reduce the cost. Um, so, you know, this is another way, I think, in which governments are trying to address the issue of period poverty. But it is far from over, you know, and we really need to be doing more to ensure that all women and girls, even if they're poor, can really access high quality products that they need to manage their menstruation every month um, without being uh, stigmatized and without being punished for, for being poor, essentially. Yeah, so you have just mentioned several steps taken by uh, different governments. So what about the cooperation? Uh, how do you think of the uh, East and West can cooperate to eliminate uh, the period poverty? So I think definitely, I mean, in fact, even here, we, we've worked with some private uh, sector companies, including Anson a Angel, but they've actually reached out to us and said they'd be interested in working with us in terms of looking at opportunities in Africa, where um, they can take a play a bigger role in terms of making sanitary products available. So I think for all corporations that are interested in corporate social responsibility, um, regardless of whether they're in the East or the West, recognizing that we live in a global world. I think there are ways in which they can make contributions to help the poorest women, whether they're in their own countries or in other countries, I think particularly in sub-Saharan Africa where we see the greatest challenges, they, they have a role to play in terms of donating products and, and maybe even helping uh, local manufacturers in African countries strengthen their, their production as well. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 那么接下来这个问题是问可酱的。我们之前收到过一些网友的留言,就是在经期的时候有一个争议是用卫生巾好还是卫生棉条好。那么你可以在这个时候给我们做一些科普吗? 
。但是呢，这两种呃这两种东西啊，同样作为经期的这样护理的产品，它本身是没有优劣之分的。至于要怎么选，其实还是完全依赖于个人的一个使用喜好。啊，因为像我身边有的女性朋友，她不习惯用棉条，或者是呃存在像是阴道痉挛这样的情况呢，她也用不了棉条啊。但是呢，有的女孩子哦，在用了棉条之后，发现啊，她确实是比卫生巾用起来好像要清爽很多，而且也不用担心侧漏，还不用担心那个运动的话怎么办啊？这还是有很多的便利在的啊。但是呢，新的问题也来了，有的女性朋友在用棉条的时候，其实她是感受不到呃任何的感觉的，所以。当那个棉条其实该换的时候，他也感受不到、啊，所以这样可能就是有点麻烦啊。但是呢，使用卫生棉条的话，呃，有一些是必须必须要注意的，就首先是要选对它的吸水性，呃，因为如果吸水性过强的话，它会导致呃阴道内部的过于干燥，呃，会引发一些就是其他的这种安全的隐患，啊、当然了，选择这两种，呃，与其去焦虑是我到底选棉条还是选卫生巾。不如说，呃，我们把更关键的呃视线放在你到底会不会，就是有没有及时的去更换。因为像是卫生巾的话呢，可能是要两到三个小时一更换；卫生棉条的话，不能超过八小时。一般建议可能四到六小时，呃，就一定要更换了。因为放的时间过长的话，就相当于你随身携带了一个小的细菌包。而且卫生棉条在使用时间过长的时候，它也会导致整个环境干燥，啊、呃，一一不小心一点点小的破损，就可能会造成这样的感染。这个是关于这个问题的一个科普。嗯。所以刚才我们也聊到了一个非常常见的一个争议啊，呃，也谢谢柯将对我们的科普。接下来这个问题其实也非常常见啊，男生当然不会体会这个经期的感觉啊，但是我们知道很多的这个女性朋友啊，呃，都会在经期经历一个事情，就是痛经啊、呃。那么这个痛经的话，跟身体素质差这个有直接的关系吗？这个问题可能是大家长期以来的一个误区，因为可能我们身边有很多呃长辈的女性朋友会说，哎呀，你痛经就是因为你宫寒，你身体不好，你体质差啊。但其实从科学的角度来讲，这个痛经啊，呃，即便是在没有病理性影响的情况下，人与人之间的差距也是非常大的。啊，像我的话就是。呃，在经期就不会疼，但是我身边也有朋友就是疼到需要去打幺二零去求救的那种程度，呃，这个就是一个很自然的一个体质的差异，并不等于说呃不疼就一定是健康，疼就是不健康啊、呃，这个是一个错误的认知，因为大家知道这个月经来潮其实呃它是这种子宫相当于子宫内的皮肤的一个更新迭代，因为我们知道我们皮肤嘛，呃这个表质呃皮肤的表质层。啊，它会脱落一些皮屑，这是正常的一个表皮细胞的更新。而月经来潮呢，它是会呈周期性的，然后以一个月为一个周期，集中的去脱落，而且它会受到激素的影响。所以说到激素啊，呃，激素它就是呃让大家就是饱受痛经折磨的一个非常重要的原因。其实痛经它主要分成两种，呃，一个叫做原发性的痛经。这种原发性的痛经呢，其实直接影响的就是呃，就是激素的原因。因为大量的研究研究其实已经证，大量的研究其实已经证实了，在月经期间呢，因为这个前列腺素的合成和释放所导致的这样的呃子宫收缩的它的一个不规律啊、呃，所以你才会会疼，会感觉到疼。然后另外呢，像是呃血管加压素的升高以及催产素这样的不同的激素作用之下。哎，你的子宫收缩的不规律了，然后有有局部有那个呃流血不畅的情况，所以你才会疼。像间接的因素呢，有一些，比如说你吃了刺激性的东西，或者是过于的疲劳，也会导致子宫收缩。另外呢、呃，也有一些研究反映了那个精神情况，就比如说像有焦虑、抑郁啊，还有内向的人可能会更容易痛经，但是这个并没有一个呃一致的结论啊，这个是只是有一个可能性。除了上面这些原发性痛经呢，还有这种继发性痛经，它就是相当于由其他的疾病导致的痛经，嗯、呃，像是有这种子宫内膜异位症啊，还有慢性的这个盆腔炎啊、子宫肌瘤啊，这些其实也会导致痛经。然后像继发性痛经的话，就是你得把病治好了，你才可能会不疼。好的，非常感谢可酱啊。那接下来这个问题还是问康家庭博士啊。So Dr. Carson, 
I know you have stayed in China for a while, and、uh, you may ha have ever heard that、uh, Chinese women would love to drink hot water during the、uh, menstrual period. So, but actually, this phenomenon can not be easily seen in the other countries. So, could you please,、uh, as for the healthy tips,、uh, do you find any similarities or differences、uh, between different countries? So, I, I think、um, you know, if if you want to drink hot water while you're while you're menstruating because it makes you feel better, I, I mean, that has no negative impact on you. You know.、Um, In the same way, I mean, for example, we we see a very common myth around this idea that that women and girls are weak when they are menstruating and therefore shouldn't、um, get involved in any physical activity or exercise. But actually, again, it's about your personal choice. So, how do I feel when I menstruate? You know, do I find that if I do some activity or some exercise, it helps me maybe manage the pain of menstruation, or you know, I feel strong? So, this is very much about. Individual choice. For example, you know what we see in many countries is this idea that if you are an adolescent girl, then you shouldn't use tampons. But actually, there's absolutely no reason why adolescent girls can't choose to use tampons when they start menstruating. But it's a choice. So, what's right for me as a girl or a woman? Do I want to use a tampon? Do I want to use a pad? Do I want to use a menstrual cup? And so, really, it is down to individual women to find out what's right for them in terms of managing their menstrual health every month. For example, we know that. Globally, the average is about twenty percent of women will actually experiencing quite debilitating pain during、um, their menstruation every month. So, for them, obviously, the way they manage their menstruation, the importance of being able to access good pain medication and receive counselling from a health worker, is more important than maybe for women who really don't face any challenges when they menstruate every month. And so, I think you know, individual choice. Based on the correct information, is really is is what's the most important thing. Okay, thank you, thank you, Doctor. 啊，接下来这个问题是问一下何酱啊，就是刚才我们也聊到了近期好多的这个保养的秘方啊，呃，有没有哪一些秘方它其实是有误区的或者不正确的呢？其实提到这个“近期保养”这个词哈，我觉得“保养”这个词可能不是特别准确，因为首先近期大家只是直觉上觉得嗯很虚弱，也很难受。但其实它不是一种健康损耗，不像是病需要养，啊、呃，它只是一个正常的生理现象，所以我更偏向于用护理管理这样的词，啊、呃，但是呢，现在我们能听到的，就包括身边的朋友说，以及网上那种特别流行的论调啊，那种所谓的经期保养秘方哈、啊，就是大多数不太靠谱，啊、呃，但其实呢，这些里面哈，呃，只有说可能是热的东西，热饮热本身，还有。热水、热敷这一些可能会对这个呃舒张这个血管有一点点作用，可能会缓解一点点的疼痛，但也不是适用于所有的人。所以喝热水确实没毛病，但是它可能没什么用。但是红糖呢，是真的呃，因为它的原料是甘蔗嘛，它里面这个大多数成分，它 95% 以上都是蔗糖，也相当于你喝糖水，喝糖水你是不可能止疼的。然后另外就是刚刚呃 ，Doctor c o s o n 也有说到过，就是运动这个呃，在经期运动的话。呃，其实是不推荐做那种骑跨类的运动，特别剧烈的，比如说要骑行，骑行很远的地方啊。这个因为，呃，你整个呃，包括子宫啊、外阴属于一个充血状态，是比较脆弱的，可能会造成一定的损伤。啊、但是其他的就是其他的运动啊，其实还可能有缓解痛经的这样的效果，适当的运动是 OK 的。但这个也是呃因人而异，就是说，如果你真的痛经非常非常严重。那你也不要勉强自己爬起来去运动，这个是根据自己的情况来。然后这个说到可能会造成的一点点损伤，主要还是会加重痛经的情况，或者是呃，就是会让你的出血量增多。这个也不会说导致什么其他的病啊、癌症啊，这些都不会。所以说经期运动也是 OK 的，要根据自己的情况。但是呢，经期有一个事情是真的真的不能碰的、不能做的，就是不可以手术，也不可以献血。嗯。呃，不建议大家哈，不建议，非常不建议。
。好的，好的，感谢柯将的分享。啊，那么接下来呢，我们在聊完了这个经期的问题之后啊，我们也想从更大的一个层面来聊一聊，呃，怎样去保护女性的权益。呃，所以我们接下来在这一部分还是要问一下康家庭博士。So the next question is for Dr. Carson, and could you please briefly introduce the current projects of uh, uh, UNFPA to protect women's rights and interests globally? Of course, thanks. I mean, so so UNFPA is um, the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency. That's what we really focus on, and obviously, at the heart of that are the rights of um, women and girls. So, for us, everywhere we work, we are working towards a world where we want to have no more preventable maternal deaths. We want every woman and, and adolescent girl who wants to prevent an unintended pregnancy to be able to access a modern, reliable method of contraception of her choice. And we're also working to a world where we want to see no more violence against women and girls and where we want to see no more harmful practices, for example, such as child marriage or son preference. And so these commitments are really what drive our work everywhere we are. Um, but the way that we work is that when we're in a particular country, we sit down with the national government and other partners, we talk through the priorities in that country context, and then together with the national government, we will design a, a program for that country that really addresses the specific priorities of women and girls in a way that is also um, culturally appropriate. So for example, in China, and we've been here in China working closely with the government and other partners for over 30 years, um, you know, we've worked on issues such as strengthening uh, maternal health services, and China has seen a phenomenal uh, increase and improvement in the quality of maternal uh, care in this country, and at the same time has seen a phenomenal decrease in preventable maternal deaths. Um, we've also worked on increasing access and choice to contraception and family planning methods, not just for married couples, but also looking at the needs of, of young unmarried couples um, as well. We do a lot of work increasing access to sexuality education, so age-appropriate sexuality education for young people, whether in secondary school or college, um, and also working with young people on leadership skills and entrepreneurship skills. Um, we do a lot of work with local partners, working on uh, quality of life and rights for people with disabilities, including their sexual and reproductive health. Um, and we've also done a lot of work at both national and provincial level to um, support ending sun preference um, in China. And again, you know, this is another area where I think China has made incredible progress in terms of shifting away from a very strong sun preference to a much more gender balanced um, approach. And then we also do a lot of work on, you know, population data. So looking at trends in fertility, trends in aging, trends in population size with our government partners, and then reflecting uh, in terms of what does that mean for future policies and programs in China. And uh, you have uh, said in an interview that the United Nations has never needed cooperation as much as it does now. So what is the reason of that? So I'm sure many of your viewers have heard of the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030. And obviously, the year 2030 is only eight years away. And when we think about the global targets that have been set by countries all over the world, many countries are seriously off track. They're really not on track to achieve the commitments to the Sustainable Development Goals. And one of the reasons for that is, is a lack of sufficient uh, financing being invested. So, for example, for UNFPA, and I've just talked about our work on maternal health, on contraception, on ending gender-based violence, just for the areas of our work, we've calculated that every year for the next 10 years, we would need to invest globally another 22 billion US dollars if we were really to deliver on the targets for, um, you know, ending preventable maternal deaths, access to family planning for everybody who needs it and ending gender-based violence and harmful practices. So a greater investment um, in, in the sustainable development goal agenda is needed. However, it's not just about that. It's also about how can we harness new technologies, new innovation, 
to really accelerate progress in those countries that are lagging behind. And this is where we really need partnerships with the private sector. You know, the private sector is often so quick and nimble at developing innovative solutions to problems that they define, very often quicker than the United Nations, for example, or even quicker than a national government. And so in this way, the private sector partners can really bring in a whole new set of skills and way of working that if we bring together governments, the United Nations and the private sector, then we could really have um, you know, much quicker progress. So for example, when we think about menstrual health, you know, one of the major issues globally is that women and girls do not have the information that they need to really understand how to manage their menstrual health. So if we look at a company like Kwaisho, where, you know, Kwaisho has this incredible reach through a live streaming platform, it has this really innovative approach to community-led content, then how can we harness an innovative approach like that and then use it to actually ensure that we can get high quality information out to as many people as possible around issues of sustainable development that will allow them to be better educated to improve their health. So in this way, I think partnership is key. And this has been recognized, I mean, this isn't just me saying this, this has been recognized by the Secretary General and by the principals of all UN agencies. I mean, we now have the UN Compact where companies all across the world have really signed up to work with the UN and national governments to accelerate progress on the SDGs. Mm, thank you very much. So you just mentioned that um, uh, as for the menstrual helps, actually what the UN can provide. So generally in terms of women's health, uh, what the UN can collaborate and help? So, I mean, I, th I think what, what the UN brings to the issue around menstrual health is um, both a convening power, so we're very good at bringing together national governments, private sector, community organizations, all to focus you know, on a particular issue and to collaborate and work together. I think what we also do is, you know, when we work in one particular country, we can bring together this global experience, this global best practice. We can help to broker partnerships between different countries who maybe have succeeded in different areas to share experiences. Um, we have a whole range of tools and modules and you know other technical products that we can then bring into a country and help a government to contextualize um you know for, for their environment so i think there's many different ways in which we can um support development goals and particularly menstrual health in that way 那接下来我们也想问一下可降就是你觉得中国和外国通过合作可以怎样帮助女性呢 我相对于我这呃，相当于我们这种那个普通的创作者来说哈，我们也只能是说呃尽自己所能呃去影响更多的人呃去将正确的知识去让更多人知道啊。但如果是呃中西方合作，可以到一个更高的层级上去的话，也
啊，另外呢，像是呃中外的这种 NGO 组织啊，还有慈善机构啊，以及各种那个独立的志愿者个体也可以啊、呃，比如说到贫困地区去进行宣讲，也就是呃刚刚 Doctor Carson 说到的这个消除呃那个贫困地区啊、发达地区之间的这样的差异嘛。让大家都可以拉齐这个认知，都树立正确的观念。好，那接下来这个问题是想同时问一下二二位啊。So the next question is actually for both of you. Firstly, we want to ask Dr. Cozen, and so as for、uh, eliminating the、uh, period、uh, discrimination or menstrual discrimination, what we men can do? So as I was preparing for this interview, I, I was thinking back to my own childhood, and I remember. I mean, it's now forty years ago.、Uh, I was at school. I was twelve years old, and when you were a twelve-year-old girl in my school, you were taken away for the talk. And what happened when the talk happened was all the boys were left in the classroom, and all the girls. Were taken to our school hall, and we had a thirty-minute presentation on periods, on menstruation. And I remember this very, very old nurse came out, and she got out this sanitary pad that looked like a diaper. It was so old-fashioned. And then we weren't allowed to really ask many questions. And then it was over, and we were sent back to our classroom. You know, and and this is such an old-fashioned way. Of of talking about menstruation with young people, and after that thirty minute talk, there was never a space to discuss periods, menstrual health ever again in the, my next five years of schooling. And the boys actually got virtually no information or guidance about menstrual health. Now, if we fast forward to twenty twenty two, just a few weeks ago, I was in a, an event here in Beijing on women and global health. And three male ambassadors all stood up and talked about period poverty in their own country and about what their governments were doing to support women and girls around menstrual health. And they did that without any embarrassment, and they did that without any requirement from the women to push them to talk about this issue. So I do think that globally we have seen a huge shift. In terms of men who are in decision-making positions, being much more willing to talk about menstrual health and to talk about,、um, you know, the role that they can play in terms of making things better for for women and girls. But we now need to see that done systematically all around the world. So it should never be that anybody has the experience I had when I was twelve, you know, where we only talk. To girls, once about menstrual health while they're at school, we now need、uh, a school curriculum,、uh, both in you know in the biology curriculum, in the sexuality education curriculum, where boys and girls together hear about menstruation, and they hear about how it is a normal biological process. It's not a taboo.、Uh, they can hear about menstrual health management. You know, so everybody has the information. And then at the same time, I think you know, men who who have this decision making power. So whether they are a manager or a member of a government, maybe they're a community leader. They also need to be educated on how. Taboos around menstruation can have such a negative impact on women and girls, and they really need to be encouraged to stand up and speak out and prevent that type of stigma and taboo from happening. And in that way, I think we can really bring men in as champions to improve、uh, the menstrual health of women and girls around the world and really improve the experience、uh, of of women and girls.、Um, most definitely. Okay, thank you, thank you, Doctor. Ke Jiang 呢 ？Ke Jiang 是怎么看待这个问题的？就是，呃，我们在这呃消除这个经期歧视的这个问题上，就是呃，男性可以做哪些帮助呢？所以我觉得呢，就是男性首先做的，呃，我期望的哈，还是可以做到一个基本的呃理解和了解。呃，虽然刚刚刚那个呃 ，Dr. Carson 是拿一个自己的例子来来说的，但其实呃，确实在现在的教育的时候，可能呃。就我们在被教育跟女性知识相关的问题的时候，可能也是要专门把女生呃就放到一块儿去说，然后男生可能就完全也不会跟他们说呃会怎么怎么样，然后这导致大家长大了之后啊、呃、就可能在认知上会有很多很多的偏差，再加上呃女生在这个经期会有这种 P M 呃 P M S 综合症，也就是经前期综合症。
会出现呃，就是不可控制的易怒啊、暴躁啊、失眠啊这样的情况。如果很多有很多人他不理解呀、啊，就是有很多男性还会指责女生说：“哎，你为什么会这样，对吧？你为什么好多男又生气了？”呃，如果你了解了这个知识，你就不会再去指责他了，就会更多的去理解他。呃，理解其实就是建立在了解的基础之上。如果你的身边是有比较亲密的这样的呃异性的伙伴啊，就是比如说像是你的伴侣也好，你的家人、你的妈妈、姐姐、妹妹。呃，你如果你可以更直接的给他提供到帮助，比如说帮他买呃这种护理用品啊，或者是在他呃这个很难受的时候，就是呃给予足够的关怀吧，这个也是我们能做到的，呃，就是我们男性朋友能做到的一个呃小事儿。如果还有余力的话，或者是你也有这样的呃意向的话，也可以加入到呃这样女性知识宣讲的这样的活动当中，宣传的活动当中，让更多人去。呃，了解这个女性知识，去打破呃男性与女性之间关于女性知识的这个认知的隔阂，呃，让大家都可以基于一个正确的认知去判断。嗯，感谢可匠啊，呃，那么所以在节目的最后呢，我们还是想问二位大对大家有什么特别要叮嘱的吗？首先，可匠。所以呢，还是呃希望大家都可以树立一个正确的认知。呃，因为经期、月经这个本来就是一个正常的生理现象，是地球上一半人都会经历的事情，它是没有必要羞耻的。然后我也非常的期待呢，呃，能用我自己的呃一点点微薄的力量吧，可以呃影响到大家去树立树立这种正确的认知，然后纠正这个错误的认知。可以希望将来有一天，呃，全世界范围内都可以消除这样的呃。月经歧视、月经羞耻，还有月经贫困，呃，这些问题都不会再存在了。我们身边呢，也可以看到，大家可以大大方方的去谈论，啊、呃，谈论月经，可以谈论卫生巾，谈论这些护理用品，然后互相去，呃，去递这个东西的时候，也不需要再遮遮掩掩了。呃、希望有朝一日这些现象都已经不再有了，大家可以大大方方的去讨论这个问题，可能到这个时候才是真正。消除这样错误认知的一个好的时候，也非常期待这一天的到来。嗯，好的，感谢柯匠。So, uh, Dr. Carson, at the very end of、uh, today's program, do you have anything special you want to share with our audiences today? So, I, I think to finish off today, I have one request, one challenge, and one thank you. So, my request is, I think, for all your viewers today, you know, as they've heard us speaking. If they realise that there's things that they don't know about menstrual health and they want to find out about, I, I re, my request is really please go out and use those online resources to find the right information. So globally across the world, everybody now spends approximately two and a half hours a day on social media, and I really think if we just spent one hour a week, you know, on educating ourselves about our, our sexual and reproductive health or our health generally. Um, you know that's such a great investment of our time in our own well-being. And then my challenge is to any、um, innovative entrepreneurs that we have listening today. So you know, whilst I think we are making improvements in terms of making sanitary pads and tampons more available to women around the world, we have to find a more sustainable way of managing periods. So those disposable tampons, those disposable pads, require huge amounts of fossil fuels every year to make. They're full of plastic. They go into landfill. They contribute to、um, they contribute to methane gas. They have a large carbon footprint. Now, women aren't going to stop menstruating. So, how do we create sanitary products? They're not only good for women, but also good for the env environment. So they have a much less negative impact、um, on our environment in the future. So that's my challenge, and、um, and I'd love to hear from anybody who has any ideas about that. And I think finally, it's a thank you. And、um, you know, I really want to, on behalf of UNFPA, genuinely thank Kuaisho. China News Service and Gokar for actually creating a space to talk about menstrual health today because it doesn't happen very often. It's often something that gets hidden. It's considered shameful, and so thank you, thank you, thank you for creating this space for us to to share and discuss. I really appreciate it. Thank you as well, Doctor, and、uh, thank you very much, both of you. 非常感谢二位啊。
对于女性来说，月经就像吃饭睡觉一样，是件特别自然的事情。消除月经贫困呢，不只是女性朋友的事儿，也是我们所有人的责任。也希望咱们广大的女性朋友都健健康康的。感谢大家收看，我们下期见。